Okay, thank you very much for coming to today's lecture. Um, how many is a repeater? Second time. <coughs> how many of you came for the first time? Oh, wow, it's half and half. Oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. That means we had 170 people last time, and a few people didn't come back, huh? <laughs> <laughs> But that's good, that, yeah, that's good. And um, this time I have a new toy. <laughs> what do you think this is? Notebook? If, if somebody said answer already. It's iPad. <laughs> <laughs> But people think, you know, from the outside, you you would think this is a notebook, but this is actually an iPad case. <laughs> so um, hopefully you got a um, handout today. I had a suggestion from last time. Um, it's better to have a handout, uh, so I made a handout for today's lecture. Does anybody need a handout? Yeah. If, It's about 10 page or so. Um, first three page or um, first one, two, three. Yeah, three pages. That is the uh, outline for my uh, presentation. And from third paper, uh, it's the 51 mental factors or concomitants. Uh, this is. Um, uh, what well, I'm going to talk about today, mostly, but um, it's on the third page or third paper, okay? So, um, last time I talked about introduction of Buddhism um, based on uh, life of Shakyamuni Buddha and basic teaching like Four Noble Truths and Eight Four Noble Paths. I don't know if you remember or not, but Four Noble Truths, life is suffering. Uh, suffering doesn't mean um, physical pain or something. Suffering means um, unsatisfactoriness, right? Unsatisfactoriness. Uh, we don't satisfy, that, it, that is why we suffer. And second one is cause of suffering. Cause of suffering is our greed, um, anger, uh, and we call it stupidity or ignorance. That is the cause of our um, suffering. And third one, there is uh, the uh, state called nirvana uh, we have to look for. That is the uh, third one. And fourth one is how to attain nirvana. That is the Eightfold Noble Path. Okay? And let me begin with what happened to the uh, Buddhist order after the passing of Shakyamuni Buddha uh, before I talk about Buddhism and mind. Uh, right after the passing of Shakyamuni Buddha, one of the disciples named Mahakashapa, uh, he was uh, one of the uh, most powerful uh, disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha. He gathered 500 monks um, to recite the Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching together. Because uh, right after the passing of Shakyamuni Buddha, one of the disciples started saying, oh, finally I don't have to keep any precepts or, you know, there's no teacher who scolds me anymore so I can do whatever I want to do. So Mahakashapa worried if everybody practice on their own, the teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha diminishes so quickly. So Mahakashapa gathered 500 monks and recited the teaching together. And that starts from, thus I have heard, thus I have heard. That is the beginning of the, every sutra. A sutra is um, the teaching of Buddha. Okay. And right uh, after 100 years of passing of Shakyamuni Buddha, the Buddhist order finally separated into two major groups. One is called Mahasangika, which means big group. And the other is called uh, stra um, stravi stavila stavira vada, stavira vada. 
uh, or known as Theravada. I studied Buddhist um, uh, study, and my teacher, one of my teacher told me, Mahasangika is Sanskrit word. So we should use Staviravara because that is Sanskrit word. And Theravada, that is Pali. So different language. So when we are writing paper or something, we have to be, how do I say, co co consistent, yeah, consistent, right? But today, I'm not writing paper or anything, and you know the word Theravada probably, so I will use Theravada instead of Staviravada today. But the, um, uh, Theravada is conservative groups, conservative. They wanted to keep the tradition um, such as precepts as same as Shakyamuni Buddha's time. And do you have any idea how many precepts Buddhist order or Buddhist monks had to keep? Do you have any ideas? It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a, a lot more than you can imagine. Uh, 250 for monks. 250 for monks. And um, it is said 500 or 360 something for uh, uh, nuns. Um, that is uh, precepts they had to keep. And Mahasangika is more progressive group. They wanted to um, make changes to the precepts fit to or suitable for the more, uh, the, their time of the society. So the uh, separation of Buddhist order is just like the differences of American League and National League. <laughs> American League, they have design, designated Hitler, Hitler, right? But National League, they don't have DH. So I could say American League is progressive, National is conservative, kind of. So this is I, just the idea, okay? <laughs> just the idea, yeah. It's, it's not explaining well, but. <laughs> So one thing in common between Mahasangika and Theravada was that the um, analysis, analysis, where is the accent? Analysis? Yeah. Okay, analysis of the Dharma or the teaching um, created a lot of commentaries called Abhidharma, Abhidharma. Um, this creation of Abhidharma was one of the causes to trigger the birth of new group called Mahayana, Mahayana. It was close to the first century uh, before common era. And I couldn't find the uh, good English map of Buddhism, so this is all written in Japanese, but Mahayana Buddhism had spread through Tibet, China, Korea, and Japan, uh, these blue arrows ha is how Mahayana Buddhism spread. And now Japan is still uh, considered Mahayana Buddhist countries. But most of Chinese people are not Buddhist anymore, and many Korean people are Christian. Um, and Theravada Buddhism has spread through Sri Lanka, uh, Thai, Myanmar, uh, Cambo Cambodia, and Thai. So Southeast Asian countries are mostly um, Theravada Buddhist. And this is frequent, frequently asked questions that many people want to know the differences between Theravada and Mahayana. So I just give you the um, highlights or the uh, summaries of differences. And I would say uh, Theravada is more discipline-based type of Buddhism or keeping precepts. And of course their knowledge of sutra is really amazing. They stay in monastery most of the time to study. So their life is 24-7 Buddhism. And 
it is said that all, all the men, most of the, most of the men in Thailand being a monk once in their lifetime. And the Thai, Thailand's king, they have to become a monk at least once before they become king. That's it. interesting, isn't it? So if you see um, a man from Thailand, you can probably ask, um, why you monk before? Then he probably say yes. Because I read about 80% of men in Thailand become monk at least once in their lifetime. But they don't stay as a monk. They come back to secular life to have um, their own life. So it is a little different from the other um, Theravada Buddhists like a Sri Lankan Buddhist. And Mahayana Buddhism uh, occurred around first century um, before uh, Common Era. And Buddhism came into China around first century after Common Era. So all the Buddhists, Buddhism scriptures came into China ignoring the time order, which means like um, um, sacred scriptures like Dhammapada. Uh, I talked about Dhammapada last time. But Dhammapada, um, then the Abhidharma came in. And after Abhidharma, Mahayana Buddhism uh, um, occurred. But when Buddhism came into China, everything came together. So Chinese monks had to organize the sutras or teaching or commentaries in time order. That was the beginning of um, denominations in China. So like a uh, Tendai school in China, they relies on one of the sutra called uh, Lotus Sutra. Um, and then they say they don't have any specific sutra to rely on, but they have a sutra called Diamond Sutra. So every denomination have different sutras to rely on. And that is because according to the time order they discovered or they um, insisted, this sutra is talking about um, what Shakyamuni Buddha really want, wanted to say. Um, so our tradition, Shin Buddhism, we say that the larger sutra of uh, Buddha of immeasurable life, that is the uh, sutra which Shakyamuni Buddha really wanted to talk about. Um, so then all, all denominations have different sutras uh, which we rely on. Okay. Okay, um, anyway, Mahayana um, tradition, there are two main streams. One is called Madhyamika, uh, or Middle Way School, uh, founded by Nagarjuna in, uh, in India. And famous idea, how many of you have heard of the idea? Emptiness. Emptiness. That is a really um, famous idea of Mahayana uh, thought, Mahayana philosophy. Um, but empty doesn't mean uh, like nothing. Well, nihilism, nihil, nihilism, nihilism. Um, <laughs> empty means nothing possesses self-nature. Nothing possesses self-nature. That mean, that is emptiness. So I will try to explain this later, uh, hopefully. <laughs> and second one is called Yogacara, Yogacara, uh, or representation on the uh, school, theory of school, uh, established by Asanga and Basvandu. Um, Asanga and Basvandu were brothers. And this is a school which really studied deeply regarding our mind. And this school thought is my main focus of study, so I, won't, I will not talk about too much um, about Madhyamika school, middle way school, but I will focus on the Yogacara school of thought today. Then, why mind is so important in Buddhism? Why mind is so important in Buddhism? 
Do you remember I talked about karma last time? Karma doesn't mean destiny or fate, but karma means action, right? And in Buddhism, there are three actions, verbal, physical, and mental. So three actions. And do we say something without thinking? Sometime, but usually we think and say something, right? Do we act without thinking? If sometimes, <laughs> how do you know you can walk? Because you know it's in your head or it's in your mind. So mind is the beginning point of all the actions. Okay. So we can try to control how we speak and how we act. But this control comes from our mind. And when we say harsh words to someone, we reflect our speech in our mind and feel sorry for saying harsh words to someone. So mind is really important. Cultivating the mind is really important in Buddhism. And I will share Dhammapada uh, verses one and two. It said, I don't have my note. <laughs> All experiences preceded by mind, led by mind, made by mind. Speak or act with corrupted mind, and suffering follows as the wagon, wagon wheel follows the hoof of the ox. Hoof, right? <laughs> hoof, okay. <laughs> Sometimes I say funny thing, but just ignore it. <laughs> Verse two, all experiences preceded by mind, led by mind, made by mind. Speak or act with a peaceful mind, and happiness follows like a never departing shadow. So, Dhammapara is considered as the uh, original word of Shakyamuni Buddha. So, um, this is the word of Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, original teaching from Shakyamuni Buddha. And so, the, you can see, you can see that the mind is really important in Buddhism from these verse, verses. Then. What is mind, anyway? What is mind? Where is it? So, I will share this one. This is the uh, representation only school's idea of mind. What is mind? First sex, visual, auditory, olfactory, uh, gustatory, tactile, and mental uh, consciousnesses. These are co uh, called surface mind. So we can actually feel that it, it is working. I can see people's face. I can hear my voice from speaker. I can smell. I don't smell incense, but sometimes I smell incense. I don't want to t taste microphone, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I can touch tables, microphone, and feel that, right? And think, oh, this is table. This is microphone. So all the six consciousness uh, is surface mind. And last two. Seven and eight is subconscious. Um, one is called afflicted mental consciousness. In Sanskrit, manas. And number eight is storehouse consciousness called alaya. alaya. And I'm sure everybody have heard of the word alaya before. Do you know what? Do you know where? Oh. What, is, what do you think the picture of this mountain is? Mount Everest? Yeah, Mount Everest. Where is it? Mount 
Everest is Himalaya, right? Himalaya. You have heard Alaya in Himalaya. So the word Himalaya is combination of Hima and Alaya. Okay? Hima means snow. And Alaya means storehouse. So the mountain's name, Himalaya Mountains, that is, that means storehouse of snow. <laughs> Neat name, isn't it? Because <laughs> I never seen the Himalaya Mountains picture without uh, snow, right? So this word, uh, name, Himalaya, really describes well the name of the mountain. Then, what does Alaya stores? What does Alaya stores? According to Yogacara, a representation of this school, it, it said it stores seeds or potentiality. Seeds or potentiality. Do, do I have? Yeah. The impression we acquire through experiencing something is stored as potentiality. And so this is a working of input into Alaya. And all the experiences and impressions we stored in Alaya is now appearing and creating the world outside of us. So this is output, okay? For example, how many people think that I have big hand? Maybe not in the United States. <laughs> in Japan, my hands are big. <laughs> but compared to what you think small or big? Compared to what? Your own hand. Your? Your own hand. Own hand. Oh, my own hand. That's true, huh? <laughs> so that is the uh, impressions from your hand, right? Then you are comparing my hand with your hand, and oh, your hand may be small or big. So. What is the truth of my hand? Is my hand small or big? Average. Average? <laughs> Perfect answer. <laughs> right? So we are judging. We are judging or distinguishing people or things based on the potentiality stored in our consciousness. Because we had um, something to compare in the past stored in Alaya, we can say this is big or small, long, short, something like that. Uh, to make it easier, have you, have you seen the movie Inside Out? So potentiality is like this memory ball with impressions. So uh, this movie showed like when you have happy experience, the ball is yellow. When you are angry, ball is red or something like that, right? So it occasionally appears in our surface mind. Um, how many people see, actually saw this movie? It, it's it's nice movie. Um, actually, I think this movie really well describes how the mind works in Buddhism. And so the, um, the potentiality stored in our alaya consciousness pop, sometimes pops up. Oh, it's not working. Yes. Like this. So when I, when I close my eyes and I try to remember my olden days or uh, school days or something, I can picture right, the experiences I had impressions I um, acquired. Um, so occasionally pops up 
or actually always popping up in our on, onto our surface mind. That is the idea of yoga chara. Um, I don't know why I have put this picture, but <laughs> <laughs> if you saw the movie, you know this one. But um, this is another example. But how many people like this thing? What is this? Yeah, right, cilantro. How many people doesn't like this? <laughs> half and half, right? Um, some people love it, and some people does not. So that is because we all have different impressions stored in storehouse consciousness. So whenever people who love cilantro see cilantro, they cannot wait to taste it. But whenever people who doesn't like cilantro see cilantro, they feel e. Eh. <laughs> right? So what we are sensing, what we are sensing, are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, and thinking. Um, all people and things around us is just the projection of our mind, just the projection of our own mind. I have shared this before at my Dharma message. Uh, every Sunday I, have, uh, I gave Dharma message. But I am the only person I ca uh, who can see the faces of everyone. And some people are looking at me. Some people are maybe sleeping already. <laughs> right? So, um, but um, what I want to say is some people look really serious and some people look uh, bored, but maybe what I feel as, oh, this person may be bored, might be having good time or enjoying it. Or some people who look serious and look, uh, you know, listening carefully, maybe not listening well. So, Everything or people is just a projection of our mind. Uh, one of my teacher, um, Koitsu Yokoyama, he told, uh, he said, um, "There is no person you don't like outside of your mind." Uh, does it make sense? So, what I feel as, "Oh, I don't like this person," is just a projection of my mind. So there is no really a person in front of you who you don't like. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? <laughs> so this is a general idea of how representation only school uh, understood the working of the mind. Um, I'm sure you have uh, many questions regarding the, uh, this perception of the mind, but um, I will accept the question later and I would like to share the other verses uh, from Dhammapada. And this is verse 183. It said, uh, doing no evil, engaging in what's skillful, and purifying one's mind. That, this is the teaching of the Buddhas. Doing no evil, engaging in what's skillful, and purifying one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Uh, this is one of the favorite uh, verses of uh, Dogen, the Zen master. Um, but reading this verse, verse from Dhammapada raises another question. What is evil and what is skillful means? What is evil and skillful? And according to the original word, evil is papa. Papa, not papa, papa. And skillful means uh, kshala, kshala. And the word evil contains different meanings to Christian people, probably. So I would like to stick with the translation unwholesome and wholesome today. And papa is unwholesome mind, and kshala is wholesome mind. And this is on your handout too, so you can look at it uh, when you go home if you have, if you can remember what I said. Then, 
I'm asking you many questions, but I'm answering myself. But what is unwholesome mind and wholesome mind? What is unwholesome mind and wholesome mind? So through looking at these minds, we, I would like to think about how we should live this life. Okay? And according to Vas Vandu's uh, 30 verses on representation only, this is his main work. Um, do I have it? Yeah, here. Uh, there are 51 mental, mental factors. Uh, you have a handout of the list of 51 mental factors. Uh, that is on page, uh, not page three, but paper three, third paper. It says 51 mental factors, con concomitants, concomitants, concomitants. How many of you know a Vietnamese monk named Thich Nhat Hanh? Okay, maybe a few. But um, he, his idea of mindfulness came from understanding of these 30 verses of um, representation on this uh, written by Vas Vandu. So he studied uh, these 30 verses um, when he became monk. And then he came up with the idea of mindfulness. And I think once we become aware of the components of our mind, we will be mindful of our daily lives. So this is really important for me to know the, what is wholesome mind and whole, unwholesome mind. And first one you see on the handout uh, is the uh, five omnipresent functions. Five omnipresent mental functions. So this is like the um, main plug of the uh, extension cord. When the mind is working, omnipresent um, com mental factor is always working. So it's, it's like main plug of extension cord. But the other set of minds, such as five specific concomitants, is like the plug socket with individual switches. When wholesome mind is working, unwholesome mind is not working, and vice versa. So, you know, you know the extension code like this, right? When we plug in the wholesome mind and switch, turn the switch on, this unwholesome mind is not working. But the other way around, when unwholesome mind is working, wholesome mind is not working in our mind. Okay. So from a Buddhist perspective, try to turn off the unwholesome mind and turn on the wholesome mind all the time is the ideal state. It's the ideal state. But our switch of unwholesome mind is, seems broken or stubborn, hard to turn it off. So let's start from looking at what consists unwholesome mind, then we realize what work we should be done for unwholesome mind. And according to the Sari verses, there are 26 mental factors that consist unwholesome mind. This is called klesha. And we often translate this word as defiled mind or blind passions. Uh, let's pick some of the mental factors which can relate to our daily lives. And one of them which is easy to relate to our lives is uh, page there's a page number on the um, handout. That is page, uh, no, page, oh, tut, 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 tut. 
Oh, I can't find it. Could you tell me if you find the latitude? Oh yeah, which, which is on page six. Number 14, Roman number 14. Is it Roman? Lassitude, lassitude. Lassitude. So I will give you the example of lassitude. Or well, laziness is easier for me to pronounce, so laziness. I wake, up, uh, I wake up around 5.30 a.m. every day, uh, take my daughter to the school, come to temple, and chant sutra on weekdays, walk in the office and pick my daughter up to the school, at the school and go home. Uh, this is my daily routine. But I also take kung fu lessons in Tuesday and Thursdays. So I live in the uh, west side, and my daughter's school is east side, and this is east side, right? So I have to drive Ross Island Bridge twice on Tuesday and Thursday. So I feel, some, I so sometimes feel tired, and I sometimes feel like, oh, I'm skipping the class today, and thinking, um, I am a Buddhist minister, and learning martial arts is not a criteria to become a Buddhist monk or a Buddhist minister. So I don't have to do the a class today, right? So this is my laziness. And how about you? Do you have membership with athletic club or something? <laughs> and not going? <laughs> that is laziness too, right? Um, and also, uh, today uh, we have a screen so we can uh, see the full altar here. But after the class, maybe we can see. Um, there's a certain way to adorn the altar. Uh, we, and we have to put rice offering and flowers um, and things. But sometimes um, I feel that well, no one's going to punish me if I don't so, if I don't adorn the altar, so it's okay. This is my laziness too. And this is the story I heard from the other minister, but he visited one of the members' house, and he found good-looking home-sized altar in the members' house. So he was happy to see the altar, and he was praising how the altar looks good. But he found something strange on the altar. So this is the, uh, how rice offering looks like. He first thought this is rice offering on the altar. But when he get close, he found out it was a golf ball. So that is true that no one is watching or no one is going to punish if the one doesn't adorn the altar well. But by not adorning the altar, I become aware of my laziness. And that is why I, when the switch of the wholesome mind turns on. Um, there is a mind of shame in the wholesome mental concomitants, um, which is on page two. I feel shame for my laziness when I be aware of my laziness. And if I'm not aware of it, I don't feel any shame. And if I don't feel shame, I don't try to improve myself. So awareness, mindfulness, is really important factor of Buddhism. 
And let's pick another um, question, blind passions. That is on page seven, I believe. Is there forgetfulness and destruction? On sex? Thank you. Okay, forgetfulness is on page six and destruction is on page seven. Um, nowadays, we have a very amazing tool. Ta-da! <laughs> Smartphone, right? So when we have some questions, we can Google it anytime. But when I open up the uh, um, browser, bro browser, 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 well, anyway, internet, <laughs> <laughs> I am attracted to different things like sports news or something, and I forget why I, I opened the uh, smartphone. <laughs> That's my forgetfulness. Um, another example, how many of you drive, your car, uh, drive the car? How many of you drive? When we drive the car, what do we need to focus on? Cars in front of us. Okay, so in one word, safetyness or safety. Isn't it? We have to focus on safety when we drive. Well, anyway, anything, anything is okay, but um, to drive car safety, um, we have to focus on the front of the car, uh, look around, and uh, signals, and, and many things. But sometimes I see people using smartphone um, during driving or while driving. And Portland Street is kind of hilly and snaky. So how many, um, no, no, I mean the, um, I haven't seen ladies do this in Portland, but when I was in Sacramento, Sacramento Street is flat and straight. So I saw many ladies make herself up during driving or while driving. That's so dangerous, right? <laughs> and they will realize how it was dangerous when they caused the accident. And that's too late. So often, we are not focusing on what we really need to be focused on. Um, forgetfulness is something we cannot help it. But we should be careful of this mind of distraction. By knowing that distraction and laziness is unwholesome mind, we can adjust our way of living, right? Um, next and at last, I, I have a picture. This was much better. <laughs> is a wholesome mind. It consists of 11 mental concomitants. And I talked about shame, and shame is introspective type of shame. Introspective type of shame. And the other one is called fear of blame, fear of blame. That is the shame towards outside of the self. And one of the mind I would like to pick up today is absence of harmfulness. Uh, I mean, absence of harmful intentions. Absence of harmful intentions. As it is uh, described in the handout, uh, which is on page two, no, two, not two. Um, page three, isn't it? Yeah. The middle page first. yeah. Absence of harmful intentions. This is traditionally taken to be precondition for the cultivation of compassion. 
Um, before I give some example, let's see what harmful intention is. And harmful intention is on page five. It said hostility. It said the ill will that wishes for or causes suffering to come to others. Ill will that wishes for or causes suffering to come to others. So in, the, in other words, hostility is the mind to wish for others' unhappiness, right? Um, I share this at one of my message um, too, but when you see flies, what do you do? Some people said, I will kill them. <laughs> but I try to think that even the flies might have families and friends who are waiting for their return. Don't you feel sad if your family members left home and never come back? <laughs> right? So I think flies are the same thing. And through the minds of absence of harmfulness, we begin to nurture the mind of sympathetic awareness of others' pain. This is called karuna, karuna in Sanskrit. And as we read the explanation of hostility, hostility um, I had put the original word in Sanskrit right next to Chinese character uh, in parenthesis. In Sanskrit, hostility is bimsa, 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 bihimsa, bihimsa. And absence of harmfulness is abihimsa. Usually when we see the character A in front of uh, Sanskrit word, it is antonym. So, bihimsa is harmfulness, and abihimsa is absence of harmfulness. And you can find some of the examples in the handout, so when you go home, uh, you can look at um, the uh, handout and uh, try to see uh, what I wanted to explain. So, the antonym of the mind to wish for the other's unhappiness. What is the antonym of the mind to wish for the other's happy, unhappiness? That must be the mind to wish for the other's happiness, right? So this is called my Tori, my Tori. And we often hear the words uh, compassion from um, Dalai Lama. But to avoid misunderstanding, uh, compassion in Buddhism is not just pity. It is a combination of these two minds of Maitori, the mind to wish for the other's happiness, and Karuna, sympathetic uh, awareness of the other's pain. This is called compassion in Buddhism. So when I think about uh, the mass shooting happened in Las Vegas a few days ago, a week ago, um, I cannot help but feel a deep sadness towards the lives uh, who have taken in, uh, because of the, uh, one of the selfish act of one person. But what I think is that um, this type of incidents happens not because of the beliefs or tenets uh, tenet of the person, but because of the lack of mind to wish for the other's happiness and sympath sympathetic awareness of others' pain. If everyone in this world began to realize the importance of these minds of Maitori and Karuna and start to nurture them, I would think that 
the world will be more peaceful. And everyone have families and friends. And everyone have someone who you care for. And everyone have someone who care about you. And through learning the mind of absence of harmfulness, we should revisit and nurture the mind of compassion, which is my Tori, the mind to wish for the other's happiness, and Karuna, uh, sympathetic awareness of the other's pain. So this is my presentation today. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I would like to open the floor for the questions, if you have. No questions, that's good too. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Precepts, Precept, yeah. What is that? Uh, rules they have to keep. Yeah. So um, traditional Buddhist, uh, like a Sri Lankan Buddhist, um, or Theravada, uh, Theravada and Mahayana have different precepts. And Theravada Buddhist, um, they follow 250 precepts still. Um, they can own three robes. Um, like this, and under one, and underwear. Only three rolls. And one bowl to go for begging. That's it. That's the only thing they can own. Uh, but Mahayana Buddhist, um, it depends on the tradition. But Shin Buddhism, our tradition, uh, we are based on secular life. So I'm not monk. Um, I have wife, daughter, uh, son. Uh, I'm living in daily life, and I'm trying to spread the Dharma among people. So it's a little different, but yeah. And one of the famous precepts uh, is five precepts. Uh, five precepts called um, no killing, uh, no stealing, no lying, no uh, mis sexual conduct, and no drinking of alcohol. This is called five precepts. But when these precepts came into China, uh, Korea, and Japan, it changed it a little bit. Um, probably started in China. Um, somebody said drinking alcohol is prohibited, but as long as they can keep themselves, it's OK. <laughs> So uh, one of the uh, scriptures said, um, water of wisdom, uh, there is a word, water of wisdom. And one of the monk pulled out this word and called sake as water of wisdom. <laughs> but it's actually true, um, isn't it? If you drink too much, it's not good for you. But um, if I drink a little bit, I can speak English much fluently. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, word of wisdom. Word of wisdom. Yes? Okay, uh, next one is um, really focused on our tradition, uh, Shin Buddhism. Um, our tradition came into the United States in 1898. So well, we are the one of the oldest um, uh, denomination came into the United States. But unfortunately, we are not well known as Tibetan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism. So I would like to um, talk about our tradition um, to spread um, our tradition in Portland. <laughs> yeah. And one of the big differences uh, between one of the famous tradition, Zen, and our Buddhism, Shin Buddhism, we don't meditate. We don't do sitting meditation. But I consider everyday life is meditation. So it's a little different um, from Zen Buddhism. Yes.
Um, so why we put this lecture series here? Um, one of the reasons, um, what I feel, is as I talked uh, today, uh, in modern society today, uh, we are lacking the mind of um, Maitori and Karuna, the mind to wish for the other, you, so as known as compassion, right? So we are lacking the mind of compassion. So what I feel is uh, Buddhism teaching um, is one of the teaching which nurtures or cultivate the mind of compassion. And this is the mind we are lacking in our society today. So by sharing or by having these type of classes, I, I thought uh, we can share that one idea of compassion and you know, we can have more better society or better um, world. This is my intention. Um, Oregon Buddhist Temple's intention is uh, probably uh, same. Um, and I'm, I'm still new here, so probably they wanted to show uh, the new minister uh, look like. And <laughs> the flyer, you know, the character, that, that is me. But I had a longer hair, used to be. But yeah, this summer, I thought, oh, maybe I just shaved my head and, you know, I, I started to shave. And maybe I'm trying to grow, grow again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yes? You talked about the opposition of uh, hostility. Uh -huh. Sympathetic awareness of uh, the other's pain. Right. Would, that this, would empathy be in there too? Empathy. Empathy, yeah. Sometimes uh, it, it is hard to translate a uh, Chinese character into English. Like um, the one I shared, e the word evil. Um, I think the Japanese or uh, in Chinese people try to translate that as uh, evil e using Christian text or something. But evil, I don't know, is, do you think you are evil person? If I say this, everyone, everybody think no, right? And because evil kind of have an um, idea of demon or something in the word. So I'm trying to avoid using the word evil. So translation is not perfect yet, but um, we have to work on that. Yeah. Yes? Um, so on, on the altar, there are figures that uh, that depends on the uh, tradition. Uh, Tibetan probably, uh, they do. Uh, Shingon Buddhism, um, that is one of the esoteric, esoteric, esoteric Buddhism. Um, they do uh, have such kind of altar or um, they sell a charm to protect yourself. Um, they do prayer to protect yourselves. But Shin Buddhism, our tradition, we don't do any prayers or um, some, something, some statues or something to protect ourselves. But um, it's more like um, daily awareness is Shin Buddhist uh, way of living. Um, how we be mindful of this life, being here, is more important for Shin Buddhist. Yeah. Yes? So, Kushira and Las Vegas more than people, right? Mm -hmm. what, what would you say from people? For who did it? To the person that did it, before, before he did it, what would you say? Before he did it? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah, I would say don't do it, okay. Yeah. yeah, he said, I would say don't do it. <laughs> but yeah, that's true, huh? Yeah. Um, sometimes people are really narrow focused and they don't have ears to listen. 
to the other's advice, right? So I don't know why, what I could do to him, but I would say same thing. Um, I try to sh um, uh, share the idea of compassion, um, uh, my Tori and Karuna. Um, but what I think is important thing is to listen to the others um, talk or uh, what, what they are feeling now. Um, if I say too much, then people don't listen. So I try to listen, and then I try to answer. So I would probably um, ask him why uh, he's doing this and what motivated him doing this or something like that. And then I try to think about the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, sensei, you talked about the concept of wholesome mind and unwholesome mm -hmm. mind. And it's good to turn on your wholesome mind and turn off your unwholesome mind. If you can control it, yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit more how you do that? Is this a part of it? Or? Um, I, this is my understanding. And it's kind of um, jumping into the third lecture, too. But um, in our tradition, we say namo amida butsu. Namo amida butsu. Namo means I take refuge. Amida butsu is uh, a Buddha of infinite wisdom and compassion. So. Um, Amida Buddha, the Buddha of infinite wisdom and compassion, is the wholesome mind for me. So when I accept the wisdom of the Buddha, my wholesome mind turns on. But in my daily lives, usually, I'm not really paying attention to the working of the wisdom. So I'm probably living with unwholesome mind most of the time. But you know, when I do something, when I say something, uh, when I think something, and when I think about the working of the wisdom, then I realize, oh, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't have said this, or I shouldn't think in this way. And that is the working of the Nembutsu, Namo Amida Butsu. That is my understanding. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are you, is there are certain ways that you do that, slowing down to notice, noticing? Noticing, uh, what I do for noticing the unwholesome mind kind of thing, yeah. That's, hmm. When I do something, I'm, I'm trying to think for the example. My daughter is five years old. She probably doesn't know um, too much about the world, society yet. Um, she wakes up in the morning. Um, Sometimes she doesn't want to wake up, although she has to go to school. I scold her too much sometimes, you know, you gotta wake up and you know, you have to change your clothes. And, but sometimes I feel, uh, after I say something to my daughter, I feel, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that, you know, that much. Um, so it's not something I do, but after I did it, I reflect my action, then think about, oh, I shouldn't do this or something. So, important um, wholesome mind uh, is uh, shame, uh, introspective shame, and uh, shame to out outside. Uh, so, I try to think about my action all the time. I hope I answered your question, but. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. 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 
So in our tradition, being mindful of the working of wisdom is kind of um, the action or things we would do. Um, but in, our, in my daily life, I don't say Namo Amida Butsu that often. <laughs> so, <laughs> then, yeah, it's like, uh, after I did it, or I stop once, think about it, and try to do or think or say something. Yeah, uh, that is what I do most of the time. Sometimes, hmm, I don't know. I don't get really crazy angry, so I don't know. <laughs> hmm. Any example you can give me? Um, do you have any experiences you got really mad? <laughs> Driving traffic. <laughs> I, I would say Oregon's traffic is much better than California. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But when someone cut in front of my car, I probably feel, oh, why you do this? But after that, I try to think, Oh, maybe he's elder person, um, probably, um, or he needed to go that way, uh, or he's maybe new driver, um, he's still learning how to drive, uh, kind of thing. So, try to turn my anger into, um, yeah, introspection. Yes. I was just going to say, in the first uh, lecture, you described this idea of your own remote control. Oh, yeah, yeah, remote control. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. Uh -huh. And that resonated with me as far as mm -hmm. like, how you can kind of keep right. calm so, yeah. mindful. You can't do much about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's a good start. Mm -hmm. So um, she um, shared what I shared at the first lecture. Uh, we all have one remote controller that only works for myself. And we are using this remote controller to try to control people. That is why it's not working. But, so we should know this controller only works for me. And that, that makes it easier, I think. I, Um, I had people or uh, someone I don't feel comfortable with um, being t together in, you know, one, one time. But I tried to think opposite. And she always said, you know, try to tell me what to do, well, but uh, I started to think this way. Um, she, uh, she is here just to nurture my um, mind. Yeah. Um, she's not really a bad person, or well, she's not, uh, she or he is not really a bad person, but probably teaching me um, or asking me to be aware of my mind of thinking the other person um, as uncomfortable. Or my, how do I describe? Um, so he or she appeared in this world just to teach me um, my mind of judging 
or you know, dis not discriminating but uh, distinguishing. Yeah, that is what I try to do. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Do I eat animals? Yeah. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> um, I, I do think sorry for them, but um, more important thing for me, um, it's already uh, become, became meat, and if I waste it, then it's more sorry for them. I, I feel more sorry for them. So if somebody prepared the meat or um, a meat, then uh, I think that I should eat it with respect and uh, thankfulness, um, uh, appreciation. Yeah, but I don't kill animals. Because you would buy it and make it yourself at home. Yeah. You would not do that. Hmm? I. You would buy it. And I. I buy it. <laughs> Because, as I said, wasting is more disrespectful for the animals. Well, doesn't buying it cause the killing? Doesn't... When you buy it, it costs hmm. more to be killed, so it's just replacing it. Yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, idea of um, b being vegetarian in Buddhism um, it's not because of um, uh, killing or non-killing, but based on uh, pure or impure in Indian philosophy. So um, even Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, he ate meat if it's offered. And according to the story or the history, uh, he passed away because of eating raw pig meat or mushroom, either one. Uh, the scholars can't find uh, what the uh, food was um, still, but it is said maybe mushroom or raw uncooked pig. So, um, yeah, I, I see your point, but um, yeah, I, what I think is I, I should be more appreciate for what I'm eating or what I'm having. And this is my answer, I think. Yeah. Uh, so I really like what you said about how uh, we don't think how to walk, mm -hmm. just the mind knows. So it's kind of your position that the more that we get our mind to be compassionate and empathetic, that mm -hmm. we don't have to try and that we won't have to come back and like you're saying, that everyday life, you go back and think, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that we get our mind into a better state, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't, we would just live that. You don't have to think to walk, you don't have to think to be compassionate, you're just, that just is. Yeah. That, that <laughs> yeah, 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 Sorry, yeah thank question. you, yeah, thank you for sharing your, yeah. That was just yeah, I think so too, yeah. Very good way of thinking about it. Uh -huh. So, hi, Stan. Follow Buddhism? You mean? Oh, any religion. Any religion. How perfect are you going to be? I think uh, all the religion uh, 
It's based on realizing how imperfect we are, <laughs> I think. Um, Christianity, uh, Judaism, uh, Islam, um, Buddhism, all same. Uh, we have to, well, start, beginning point is we realize how imperfect we are. Um, uh, traditional Buddhism is trying to become perfect human uh, by attaining nirvana. But um, this is going to be the third lecture uh, topic too, but our founder, Shinran, uh, practiced 20 years um, of the traditional way of Buddhism and could attain enlightenment, and he sought for the uh, um, path to be the um, uh, pass to the uh, salvation or enlightenment. S you mean, you know, the, thing, the thing a lot to be perfect is that since I know no matter how I try, I cannot be perfect. I don't expect anybody else to be perfect. Yeah. Um, the one religion I know who really tried to um, pro uh, um, follow the precepts of no killing is um, uh, Jainism um, in India. Uh, one of the uh, school of Jainism, they don't wear anything. Um, and they don't, when they walk, they sweep their way so that they don't kill insects too. So if we um, really want to uh, follow the precepts of no killing, then we cannot walk without sweeping. We cannot drive because we are killing insects or, or any other animals. We see some you know, squirrels or anything sometimes. Um, Yeah, you can do anything, but um, so the so what I think is important thing is to be more aware of what I what we are doing and um, gratitude and appreciation is more important practice for uh, our tradition. No more questions. Hi. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, vegetables have li life too, yes. cycle of life that leaves falls onto the ground became, become nutrition for the trees to grow and become new leaves and the leaf fall on the ground and go on and again and again. Um, our life cycle is the same thing. We are accepting many lives into ours and when we pass away we become um, nutrition for the other's minds, um, we become nutrition to cultivate the other's minds too. So this is a life cycle. And so we are accepting the lives of so many others, um, whether it's animal or vegetable, um, we should be really thankful for what we are having um, today. And as I said uh, last time, I have a, I am a 15th generation of my home temple, and I have over 32,000 or 34,000, I forgot the number, but uh, direct ancestors. And if I didn't have any one of the direct ancestors, my life couldn't be here today. So it's the same thing. All the meals we had um, became the cause for me to be here today. So uh, yes, as you said, uh, we can't um, discriminate vegetables and animals. We are killing the vegetables too.
animals just to kill them as opposed to survive. The same with like human connection when you're connecting with this person and evaluating within yourself if you're being compassionate or not. It's all about intention, which is basically what you're saying, correct? Yes, Buddhism, as I said, uh, as I shared, the Dhamma part of us one, um, well, and verse two, uh, mind is uh, the master of ourselves, and all thing is preceded by mind, led by mind. So intention is really important. Yes. Yep. So when you connect the intention and your motive to that, the wisdom, the power that's greater than you that you're trying to focus your attention on, you do that, that's that consciousness that you're trying to achieve. And when not, and when running, um, you're more susceptible to failings and imperfections. So the whole, the, the whole idea of like when you say refocus your mind and say something, it's to attain that and to refocus. And like, is that what I'm getting? The intention on that? Intention. On not self-seeking motive, but on a pure motive of compassion and no harm and the three roots of goodness. Mm -hmm. So that would be the intention of, of focusing the mindfulness in the present moment on whatever you're doing. Yeah, so. A vegetable, an animal, or whatever yeah. it is. Make sure that it's kind of being gratitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you got yeah most of it. <laughs> yeah. No more questions. Thank you. I think. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So um, next one uh, is gonna be October twenty second. Uh, starting from same time, next, yes, uh, talking about our tradition, uh, Shin Buddhism or Jodo Shinshu. Um, our tradition is based on the Pure Land Buddhism from India. And many people um, want to know uh, what is the Pure Land and it, what is the difference between Christian heaven and the Pure Land. Um, but I would say uh, the Pure Land is not um, like a heaven, a uh, Christian heaven. Um, this is another uh, translation issue too. Uh, the Chinese character for the Pure Land, is, uh, it's a Zhou, Do. Do means the land. But according to Xinran, a founder of our tradition, and the other Chinese masters from, uh, of uh, Pure Land tradition, uh, it's more sound like a realm, so um, it's not really, I, 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 would, I would not say it's not really, but it might not be a place as we think, but it's a realm, uh, the state of enlightenment, or a realm of enlightenment. So I will try to talk about um, this altar, um, what this altar is describing, and uh, actually, this, this altar is describing the pure land and the uh, Buddha called Amida Buddha. But these two ideas are really important uh, idea of uh, Shin, uh, Shin Buddhism tradition. So I will talk about Amida Buddha and the uh, pure land. Uh, I will try to use, uh, not to use the word pure land. Uh, I try to stick with the uh, Sanskrit word uh, skabati. Skabati. Skabati sounds more accurate for me. Uh, and if I say pure land, you will imagine different thing. But if I say skavati, I, I don't think you can imagine something, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I will stick with the uh, word skavati. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming, and. I